Welcome, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to our panel on climate justice and the labor justice and the labor movement. We thank you so much for coming. We are so excited for our discussions today and our panelists. We have some snacks, some cookies and oranges over on the corner. Help yourself. Okay, so before we begin, we'd just like to do a few quick introductions. I'm Rachel and this is Juliette. We are students in Geog or Environment 402, the capstone for the climate certificate. Um, we're joined today by our fellow students who you'll meet throughout the discussion tonight and our professors, Sarah Harris and Just MC. Today and every day, the students of this certificate are talking about climate change. And it is impossible to talk about this without first talking about indigeneity. The relationship that indigenous people have with this land and the non-human profoundly inform their legal orders, cultures, and ways of living. The process of colonization disrupted these land-based practices, displaced thousands from traditional territories, and imposed a social and economic system that relies on the exploitation rather than stewardship of natural resources. Climate change is a direct outcome of a colonial worldview that relegates our living world to a set of resources to be exploited with literal, little regard for the consequences. The rights of indigenous peoples to practice their legal orders, economies, and ways of life on their land and waters are at risk of being extinguished by irreverse, irreversible shifts in the conditions that sustain life. With this in mind, I acknowledge that the University of British Columbia Point Grey campus occupies a traditional, ancestral, and unceded Musqueam territory. And as an uninvited guest and occupier on this land, I have an important responsibility to acknowledge the grounds on which we are privileged to gather in the pursuit of higher education. The colonial laws that have institutionalized residential schools, banned cultural ceremonies, and served to assimilate have deeply disrupted who we see in our student body, what is being taught, as well as how it is being taught. From the soil we stand on to the trees taller and older than us all, and if we're lucky, the ravens that pass over our heads, we see the beauty of Musqueam land. The stewards of this land have been at the forefront of defending their territory of pathbreaking court cases that advance indigenous self-determination and impede extractive practices. This classroom and space is committed to amplifying such initiatives in interdisciplinary conversation. And we encourage you to seek out more information at indigenousfoundations.arts.ubc for incredible examples of resistance and empowerment, which of course relate to the labor movement and to climate justice. Today and every day we give thanks to the land we stand on and we honor those who have called this land home for millennia. Fantastic. So this event is a part of the capstone course for the inaugural class of the Climate Studies in Action Certificate. This certificate is new at UBC and it's essentially a small minor, except you can double count courses. So classes that you take for your primary degree can for the most part be counted towards your certificate. Jess and Sarah, Jess is over there, Sarah's over there, um, are co-directors for this certificate. Feel free to go talk to them after the panel if you have any questions about their certificate. You can also come talk to any of the students or go up on the website, which you can access through the QR code there. Um, in the capstone course of this certificate, we collaborate with community partners. This term, we are undertaking, undertaking projects for the BC Teachers Federation and have been thinking about labor and climate change. Hence this panel where we will focus on what labor can teach the climate movement. Now I'll have the pleasure of introducing our fabulous speakers. Um, first, we have David Black, a former president of Movement of United Professionals, Move Up, and Canadian Office of Professional Employees, COPE. COPE has over 13,000 members in BC representing groups like ICBC, BC Hydro, Fortis, Translic, CAPU. David is a former vice president of the BC Federation of Labor, a former executive committee member of the Canadian Labor Congress, and former secretary of the Vancouver and District Labor Council. David has been a member of the BC Climate Solutions Leadership Council since 2020, advising the government on meeting its climate, its climate targets for emission reductions. Next up, we have Jen. Jen is a climate and labor project coordinator with the Worker Solidarity Network. Her work focuses on researching the intersection between environmental justice and labor justice, conducting community outreach with non-unionized workers, 
and advocating for improved labor standards for all. Informed by her experience working in food and hospitality, Jan believes collective action is the key tool needed to advance the health, safety, and future of precarious workers. Next, we have Gabby. Gabby Dobelli is a Latina settler and Jan community organizer. Gabby got her start as a student organizer when she went to UBC, where she helped lead Climate Justice UBC and the UBC Social Justice Center. Since then, Gabby has gone on to organize tenants, coordinate election campaigns, and train new organizers, as well as lead contract fights for hotel workers with Unite Here. Now, she works as an organizer building collective power for tenants in the downtown east side with the Single Room Occupancy Collaborative. Throughout her work, she strives to empower communities to fight for liberation and to build just, livable futures for all. When not busy overthinking, Gabby enjoys soccer, the ocean, and reading science fiction. And last but not least, I have the pleasure of introducing Tara Erker. Tara is an educator teaching secondary math in the Lekrungen speaking territories, also known as Greater Victoria, and facilitating union, union workshops across the province to colleagues in the BC Teachers Federation. Tara is currently a member of the BCTF Committee for Action on Social Justice, as well as the BC Federation of Labor, Climate Justice, and Jobs Committee. A lifelong trade union activist, Tara is excited to work with others to strengthen the relationships between labor and communities so that we can collectively build the power to change the world. And now, before I pass the mic to our fabulous moderators, Kiri and Carly, please help me welcoming our guests, our panelists, with a loud round of applause. Alrighty, welcome. Um, again, thank you, thank you, Joaquin, for introducing our wonderful panelists. Um, so just before we get into the fun stuff, um, at the end, the last 15 to 20 minutes, we'll open up the, like questions that, for the audience to um, ask our panelists. And so if you scan the QR code or go to slido.com and type in um, those numbers, you can write your questions kind of throughout um, the panel. And at the end, we'll review them and choose some ones to um, ask our panelists. And also you can upvote different questions that people have asked. So if you see a question that you really like that you want to be asked, give it a little like and it'll have a higher chance of getting asked during our Q&A. Alrighty, so just to start us off, um, again, thank you all for being here. Um, and if you could just, each of you, kind of contextualize yourselves, or for our contextualization within your work, um, could you just tell us about how your experience and how you got started with labor organizing and how and why did you get involved and then why did you stay involved? So I don't know if you want to like go down the line, whatever you guys want. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Hi, my name is David Black. I use he, him pronouns and I actually got started in my labor activism here on this campus. So. 30 years ago, mind you. Um, I was a student uh, at UBC, and I think it was 1993, and there was a labor dispute between QP and the university, basically the provincial government, but uh, it manifested itself here with QP 116 and QP 2950. It was basically over pay equity issues, because a lot of the women, particularly in 2950, weren't paid fairly. And um, I had fallen in with a bunch of students progressive or radical students or whatever term you want to use. And so we quickly got together and talked about how we could help support CUPE in their dispute with the university and we reco we did the thing that everybody does, we occupied the, uh, the board offices and stuff like that. But I actually got arrested one day um, by the campus RCMP because one of the things that CUPE had asked us to do was uh, to go into the main library and take books off the shelf and move them to different parts in the library, put them on the reshelving desk. I don't know if all that still is the same as it was 30 years ago, but uh, because then it would create work for the, the management librarians who had to go and do the work that normally the QP members in the library would do. So we did that, and I guess the head librarian called the RCMP. He came in and uh, arrested, I think there was about a half dozen of us, and um, there's a funny story that I won't take the time to tell, but uh, essentially threw me, ended up throwing me in the back of the police car and said he was arresting me on investigation of mischief. Scared the hell out of me because I, I was having, had been having fun and thought I was participating in a solidarity thing. But then he drove me 
uh, into the endowment lands and drop me off under the, under the BC Hydro right away. I don't know if folks know that's the most remote part of the endowment lands you could be, and it was night by this time, and said, I said, well, what are you dropping me off here for? Like the bus loops way over there. He goes, he goes, I'm going to be investigating you for mischief, and I will be talking to my supervisors about charges. You can walk home from here. So that was sort of my introduction to labor uh, at that point when I was a student. I went on, uh, graduated a couple years later, needed to find work to pay loans instead of collect student loans, uh, and got a job at ICBC. And I think that having that involvement with uh, the labor union sort of drew me to the union that it was already at ICBC at that time, and so I, got, I began to get involved with that, and it's sort of much a straight line from that day to this day. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen. I use she, her pronouns, um, and I got involved in labor organizing through my experience working in the food service industry. Um, during that time, I was recognizing a lot of sort of gendered mistreatment happening in that sector. Um, and then it wasn't until I started with WSN, the Worker Solidarity Network, um, that I sort of pivoted my attention to look at how these folks are impacted by extreme weather. So cooks standing in front of hot grills during heat waves, um, or fast food workers in drive-through windows during you know, heavy wildfire smoke, and sort of uh, recognizing the ways that um, this is almost like a doubly precarious sector um, that climate dialogue should be making space for. Um, and I'm still committed to labor organizing, um, not only through my you know, own experiences in food service, um, but also seeing the victories that come from collective action. Um, and I'll get into to some of our campaign work and what we're working toward that sort of highlight that intersection between climate and labor, but that's broadly how I got involved. Hi folks, uh, my name's Gabby, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I got started in organizing in general when I was at UBC um, as a student here. Um, and I've been, or I feel really lucky in my organizing journey because I've kind of gotten into, gotten to do a deep dive into a bunch of different types of organizing. So I started with climate organizing here at UBC um, with the UBC climate strike. Um, and then I've gotten to do electoral organizing, tenant organizing, and then I kind of found my way into labor. Um, so I decided to try labor organizing um, because I know what it feels like to be disrespected in your work, to be underpaid in your work, um, and because I wanted to fight directly against the bosses that were taking millions or billions off of working people. Um, and also because um, I really wanted to learn about labor and about how to fight directly and build power directly with workers. Um, I think it's one of the best places to grow as an organizer, and so I was really lucky to, to get to do that work when I worked for Unite Here Local 40, which is a um, hotel and hospitality worker union here in, in Vancouver. Um, and so I was the organizer for workers in four hotels in downtown Vancouver, um, leading a contract fight that ended up in a strike vote and strike action, um, and helping a hotel win their first contract, um, with or their first unionized contract. Um, and yeah, I just feel really, really lucky to have been part of the collective power that, that workers get to build and experience. Hello everyone, uh, my name's Tara, I use the pronouns they, them. Um, I love this question, I always, when I do a workshop with uh, teachers who are reps to the union, uh, we do this in our introduction. What got you involved in the union? And people have really different entry points. It's really fascinating to hear. Like, uh, you know, some people, their parents were active trade union folks and they did it from a child. And <laughs> some people, it's at the workplace. That's pretty common. Um, anyway, I have a slightly different uh, story, I think, from the, the folks up here with me. Although I was also. Um, I went to U of T for my undergrad and I was a member of the, uh, I did TA in my last year and I was a member of the union there and went on strike. Um, and then came to UBC, actually I'm a UBC grad, uh, and so was a member of 2278, but to be honest, I don't think I was particularly active or interested in the union as a graduate student. Um, but towards the end of my degree, um, I was reading and uh, I had actually done um, my undergraduate degree I had a major in logic, and so I took quite a few philosophy courses, and I <laughs> picked up a copy of Bertrand Russell's book, The History of Western Philosophy. Maybe 
Some of you have looked at it. <coughs> if you ever want, it's like a Coles Notes to uh, Western philosophy because it has one page for each philosopher, <laughs> so <laughs> you don't have to be very committed. Um, anyway, I was flipping through one day and I read the page on Karl Marx and I was completely unfamiliar with Marxism. And I was living um, in Ontario at the time and uh, we had an NDP government, Bob Ray, who had gotten elected to do all these progressive things for, for workers and really wasn't doing them and kind of none of it made sense to me and all of a sudden I started reading Marxism and it was like, wow, this is a totally different understanding of the world and I was completely captivated and um, so that started a journey for me and if you are familiar with Marx's ideas, I mean the fundamental uh, kind of theory, a theory of change, as uh, some folks would call it today, uh, is that workers are pivotal in terms of um, how we're going to move forward into a society that's organized in a way that actually benefits the, mass va the vast majority of us um, and not privileges the small few. Um, and so it was kind of from that frame of reference that uh, the next time I got a job where I was in a union, I thought, wow, if I'm taking this seriously, I guess I better do the union thing. <laughs> so, and that was a bit of addictive. So I've been doing that now for 30 years. And uh, yeah, so I'm still a union activist and still a Marxist too, so. <laughs> okay, thank you to all the panelists for sharing your experience of how you're, um, how'd you got involved in labor organizing. So the next question we have is for Gabby and Tara. Labor organizing is an effort to change what is fundamentally an unequal power relation between employers and employees. It has seen ups and downs, changes, failures, and successes over the years. Similarly, action on, um, similarly, um, the action on climate change also involves changing fundamental power relations. With that in mind, what can the climate movement learn from the labor organization's approach to power and social change? So um, would Gabby like to answer first? Thanks. Um, sure. Um, yeah, so from my perspective as someone who's been active in, the, in both the climate movement and the labor movement, um, I think one of the biggest things that climate can learn from successful labor organizing is labor's emphasis on organizing to build power and to expand the base of support. Um, what I often see in the climate movement and what, to be honest, drew me away from the climate movement or was one of the reasons that I got really disillusioned by it um, was the focus solely on mobilizing and, and advocacy instead of organizing. <coughs> and so when I talk about advocacy, to me that means kind of bringing experts to the table to try to change the minds of decision makers. Um, and mobilizing often looks like bringing a mass of people to a one-time event. Um, and it's often the same people who show up to uh, events and the majority of the time is spent talking to people already on our side. Um, and so to me, advocacy and mobilizing don't engage with enough people and they don't involve people in strategic decisions. So they, they're not powerful enough to switch or to change the base of, of, the, of power relations. Um, and, and it results in movements that can be too insular um, or that are just not focused enough on expanding how we're growing our power. Um, and so I think what labor can teach us is the, the strength of deep organizing work um, and the rigor of deep organizing that can systematically and continuously build the base. And so a, a, a couple things that I think that looks like is labor invites us to talk to people regardless of their pre-existing interest in our issues. And so we're working directly from where people are and with language that they use and being curious about what, what impacts they're seeing um, and, and how, and kind of being more grounded in, in what's going on in their lives, um, regardless of whether or not they say they care about the things that we're fighting for. Um, and so that's kind of like the, the starting point often. Um, and I think more than that, what I learned from labor as an organizer is that we're not just talking and listening to people, we're trying to move people. And that is what grows our movements. That's what makes us strong enough to win. Um, and, and moving people is how, like, for instance, I got workers who were initially against fighting for better wages, 
to vote yes for a strike. Um, and to we kind of tried to turn the hotel departments that were the most hostile to the union into ones that were willing to fight and go all the way to, to walk out on their jobs um, for things like better pay. Um, and then just a couple other things. I think labor organizing can also teach us about the importance of having tangible goals and tracking our progress in a way that I don't often see in other community organizing. Um, one of my favorite parts of organizing for a strike was we had this list of 1,000 workers that we put up on the wall. And every day we went through, okay, we've talked to these many people now. These people are supportive. These people are not supportive. How are we gonna move them? Who's gonna talk to them? Am I gonna talk to them? Am I gonna send a worker leader to talk to them? And so it was a, a way to like very systematically and very rigorously figure out how we were gonna grow our power. Um, and I think probably the most importantly to me, the key to labor organizing or another thing that labor organizing can teach us is we expand the base of power through identifying organic leaders and empowering people to see themselves as leaders, giving them the tools to fight their own struggles um, and letting them be the agents of their own liberation. I think that is a really, really powerful tool um, that, that labor can teach us because organizing work is deeply transformative and it's deeply transformative of our communities and our world, but also of ourselves. Um, and really, I think that's, that's kind of what's at the heart of it. Um, and the, the only way that we're gonna win systemic and structural change that gets at the root causes of what we're fighting for um, is through building our power and expanding our base and growing collective leadership until we're powerful enough to win. And labor can give us some ideas at the tools that we need to, to make that happen. Everything she said. <laughs> um, I think it's really important to understand that the climate crisis is a political crisis. Um, you know, it's not a technical problem. And I think we're very good at finding technical solutions. And I think, um, you know, one of the things you mentioned was kind of what, what is the climate movement weak at? Um, it's good at finding technical solutions. It's even good at imagining social solutions, um, but it's not good at thinking about how we get from here to there. Um, and you really saw that, I think, during the pandemic. That was kind of an interesting period of time where everyone, you know, we had this rising tide of activism in the, with the student strike movement, which was incredibly exciting. Um, and we were sort of just getting at the moment where there was connection between students and kind of other organized groups in society and the pandemic hit. And it was interesting to watch how the climate movement responded to that because at least a lot of the organizations that I was a part of, there was a real turning inward and then there was this idea that uh, you know, there's, there's a vacuum of ideas for the just transition. And if we just come up with what are the right ideas that represent the just transition, then in the midst of this crisis and this vacuum, people will, will pick up our ideas and implement them. And uh, that really wasn't the case, right? Uh, it wasn't good enough to say, here's a plan. <laughs> um, because there was no power behind it at all, right? And so what the labor movement, I think, really understands is that the plan is only half the equation and that um, power dynamics are fundamental to how society changes. A um, Couple other comments to make about this, the strength of the labor movement or, or what, what the climate movement can learn. Um, just in terms of, of tactics, I mean, I think if you look at um, some sections of the climate movement that rely on uh, nonviolent direct action, um, y you know, I think it's really important to recognize that going on strike is probably the most effective uh, form of nonviolent direct action. And so I certainly think other forms can be useful and should be used, but I also think that strikes are critical and that we're actually not going to win without them. <laughs> um, and so that means that there's a necessity to have labor involved. Um, I do just want to do the, the kind of flip of this question a little bit um, too, which is um, I, I, I also think there are some limitations to the labor movement um, and some things that labor really needs to learn from the climate movement. Uh, 
because I think it's important to understand as well that trade unions and uh, particularly institutionalized trade unions or trade union movements that have been around for some period of time uh, have certain features because how they're, how they're organized in society. Uh, and there are certain periods of times when the union movement is incredibly progressive and is fighting for things that are quite universal, that is they impact workers as a class of people. Um, but there are also times when trade unions can be quite sectarian and narrow in their goals and uh, both are possible. And so it's also really important not just that the climate movement is like looking to labor and learning from labor, but also that the climate movement sees itself as necessarily becoming really uh, connected and infused with uh, the labor movement. And I'm always taken aback when I go to um, sort of community climate events and I find out that people are trade union members, but they don't see their union as a place to organize. And I always have like a double sadness about that because um, you know, because obviously there's power within the union movement, but also the union movement so needs those people to be active members within it, to be bringing all the other pieces, right? <laughs> the science, the justice piece, um, you know, the decolonial piece, because I think a lot of that, um, the climate movement actually does better. Um, and so it needs to be actually part of what we're doing together. Thank you, Gabby and Tara, for these thoughtful points. Would, um, would Jen and David have anything to follow up or any reactions to what Gabby and Tara had just said? Thanks. I also agree with everything that Gabby and Tara said. So, um, and I'm going to pick up, I think, maybe a bit where Tara left off and, and maybe come back to some of the stuff that Gabby was saying. That uh, there's absolutely. It, when I was uh, at UBC, there wasn't a climate movement, there was an environmental movement. Um, and I learned later those two things were not necessarily the same thing. But um, there is a lot that the labor movement can learn from, uh, from the climate movement, particularly um, some of the newer organizations in terms of the organic organizing. And um, I think uh, Tara touched on the institutional natures of unions. And I think we can see in some ways, that d that helps to just um, explain some of the differences we see in Canada and the U.S. In that, in the United States, there's a lot more innovative things happening in the labor movement than there are in Canada right now, and I think that's because the Canadian mov labor movement, generally speaking, not universally, but generally speaking, is more conservative and institutionalized, and that's partially because of the success of the labor movement. So my union has been around since 1930 or something like that continuously in British Columbia. And we have very defined governance processes. We have staff, we, have an, we own an office. Uh, we have, there's all sorts of institutional things that my union has that makes us conservative because you know, we're interested in zoning issues uh, in the, the community we're involved because we, we're, it's our duty to look out for the best interests of our members. Um, there was an alignment where we were trying to build some housing, but that's not always necessarily the case. And we, we saw some stuff with unions and housing uh, last year in Coquitlam where the unions were not necessarily aligned with the housing stuff. And um, I think it's important as well that just about everybody who comes to the climate movement or to the environmental movement does that by choice. They have reached a certain level of personal enlightenment about the issue. They decide that they want to do something about that. It's best to do that uh, cooperative with other people. And so they choose to do that. Not as many people, in, in fact, even a very, very small number in Canada, actually choose to become union members. Mostly, they become a union member the way I did. I got a job at ICBC. There was a union there. I didn't choose that. And... Um, and many of those people view their union membership as transactional. I pay my money, I get my services. They don't actually uh, have that same um, feeling about it that Gabby was talking about. Now, put them through a strike, and absolutely, for the most part, they get it really fast, and uh, I completely and 100% agree with Gabby. When, when people go through a labor dispute in the workplace, you find activists that you didn't know were there as a union, and 
activists find themselves that they didn't know that they were activists until they've gone through that and uh, they become really, really powerful uh, uh, activists for their unions but also uh, in the larger movement. And I would say that um, one of the things that I think is really important for uh, the climate uh, group to learn from unions and unions should help with this is the concept of solidarity. Because I agree with Tara that you need, you need uh, for lasting uh, uh, changes in terms of the climate, uh, it takes, it's a, it's a challenge to existing power structures. And you are not going to do that alone. Uh, an individual is not going to do that alone. One organization is not going to do that alone. You have to do that in conjunction. And that means <coughs> making partnerships or building relationships with, with groups that you aren't always aligned with. We in the labor movement do that all the time. We have to do that, and so we're sort of used to that. In, in, the, climate, um, in the climate world and in uh, NGOs generally, I would say, they're less comfortable doing that, less comfortable um, cooperating and um, working closely with groups that uh, don't 100% share their goals. And I think that's something that, um, that both sides need to be more mature. And you, you have to be able to work with people that you may not agree with on another day because you're not going to you're not going to win this day if you're worried about the end day and also if you if you don't make if you make those relationships it makes that next conversation easier so uh, i think building those those relationships and building what we call in the labor movement solidarity is really really key uh, for uh, short-term success but particularly long-term success these are all such excellent points um I don't know how much I can add, but I think identifying shared struggles is really important here as well. Um, and one that I can maybe offer is, you know, corporate exploitation of land and humans. And I think um, historically and, and very much in an ongoing way as well, um, there are tensions that exist between the two efforts. Um, and in a very, you know, boiled down way that, that often looks like protection over the land versus protection over humans. Um, and so people, you know, see this sort of binary between the two and maybe don't see themselves uh, fitting in both. But looking at both efforts as intrinsically linked is, is really important. And another benefit of labor that I really admire is the ability to organize uh, cross sectorally. Um, whereas early environmentalism, you know, is, is critiqued heavily for being um, very white and siloed and overlooking working class struggles and voices. Um, so I think really honing in on, um, you know, identifying those shared struggles is uh, a key piece in it as well. So thank you so much for um, all of those insights. Um, you definitely raised some really important perspectives and points about the key like institutional differences between labor and climate and also how they can learn from one another. Um, so I guess specifically to Jen and David, um, speaking as UBC students, we hear ambiguous or even sometimes negative perspectives on um, and views about unions and unionized movements. So often negative opinions arise when unions um, go on strike or climate protests disrupt people's daily lives. Um, so in other words, they're not always understood as progressive or good forces. So um, how do you understand these criticisms or perhaps negative impressions um, amongst young people about unions? And how do you think labor organizing and climate organizing can move forward despite these negative impressions and challenges? Yeah, I, I really like this question. Um, I think a temporary inconvenience or disruption um, is, is worth securing long-term protections for climate and for workers. Um, and that's that's worth considering and, and thinking about. So, you know, the idea that a disruptive action like a strike or a walkout could, you know, um, enhance worker protections and benefits and higher wages um, is, yeah, something to, to really consider. And those wins would also lead to um, better livelihoods and enhanced quality of life for many people and ultimately could then provide workers with the tools um, to ensure that they have a, a very active role in the climate movement as well. Um, so if workers are able to secure basic rights like benefits and higher wages, um, they may then have the energy to bargain for, you know, um, transparency in, let's say, food waste, um, or, you know, maybe divestment campaigns from fossil fuels, uh, or carbon labels on menus. Um, but we need to make sure that those workers have the tools and those voices um, before they can play those, those very active roles, I think. 
Um, and another thing to note is that you know, good and progressive uh, policy change comes from disruption. Um, and it comes from the tireless work of organizers on the ground. And so I think ensuring that you know, the benefits of unionizing are clear to, to workers and to climate activists and young people in general, um, but also showcasing them the victories that we've won, um, you know, having five paid sick days, for example, um, or maybe someday working toward a climate paid leave. Um, one interesting story and, and you know, terrible story that I recently heard was about a tornado in 2022 in Illinois um, that took the lives of six workers in an Amazon warehouse. Um, and those, you know, tragedies uh, result in conversations about extreme weather and worker protections in a way that maybe um, we haven't anticipated or seen before. Um, and so, yeah, I think building, you know, back to David's point, building that worker solidarity and power um, between, between movements is, is really key. Thanks, Jenny. I was going to talk about solidarity again, but you've already done that. Um, I think one of the challenges for the labor movement um, as we go through uh, uh, generational change in our economy and in our unions is um, uh, the, um, the challenge that young people have or the, um, the way that young people are confronted with the issue of seniority, which is a really big issue in, uh, for many unions. And uh, it is, um, seems, um, or maybe is, uh, uh, treated as an unfairness uh, for new workers who feel like they are being held back uh, by this concept of seniority that, um, that is so firmly entrenched in, the, uh, in mo many union workplaces. Not all union workplaces, but in many union workplaces. Uh, and I guess I would quote Winston Churchill on this, that uh, seniority is a terrible system, but it's the best system that we have. Um, because uh, I would s uh, I've certainly experienced and witnessed and fought against all sorts of injustices and unfairness in the workplaces. And the only way you can, I shouldn't say the only way, um, one of the um, easiest ways to expose that is you go by seniority. So if, so if an employer has sexist hiring practices, seniority is a really easy way to expose those. If they have racist hiring or promotion practices, seniority is a really easy way to, to expose those. It's not the, not the only way. Uh, I, you know, I'm, not, I, I'm not saying that, but it is, uh, it is something that uh, has proven its worth. Um, and uh, maybe that's easy for me to say as, as a Gen Xer and talking to a, a millennials and Gen Zs maybe and don't, don't see it the same way. But um, it, it is something that I know that the labor movement is struggling with in terms of uh, the generational change that we're going through uh, in our economies and in our workplaces. So, uh, and I think that's going to continue to be an issue. Uh, if someone could come up with a better system, I think, for ensuring workplace fairness, uh, then I think there'd be a lot of openness to that. But um, it, that is uh, the way it is right now. Um, one of the things that my union uh, is uh, characterize it as a medium-sized union, so there's large unions and there's small unions. We sort of characterize ourselves as a, a medium-sized union. So we've tried to um, make some uh, really strong connections and, and tried to be a bit innovative in terms of uh, looking for ways to build those relationships with uh, um, the environmental movement and the climate movement. Um, we uh, 20 years ago, our membership at BC Hydro, interesting, we're in the BC Hydro Theater, was threatened by uh, some changes that the provincial government was making. They were privatizing big sections of the electricity system. There was a bit of greenwashing that was going on as well, uh, in that they were saying we're going to build all these small hydro projects around the province uh, that were going to help uh, climate change and get away from uh, uh, building big dams. There's some, some truth to that, but um, we were able to very easily make relationships actually with uh, environmental groups that were uh, concerned with habitat preservation and habitat destruction. Because these, uh, you know, a hundred small uh, hydro plants around the province do more damage than one big dam on the aggregate and in some pretty sensitive places. We weren't able to make those relationships with folks committed to climate because they were saying 
This energy is green energy that's being produced, and the environmental degradation in a small area is worth the, um, the uh, benefit of having green energy. And so there was a bit of, it exposed a bit of division in, in the environmental movement uh, at the time. We've gone on um, to uh, look at a threat facing our members at Fortis uh, Gas Company. So my union represents about 500 people who work at Fortis Gas. Obviously, uh, I would, um, I'll say it here now that I'm retired. I <laughs> probably couldn't have said this a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a sunset industry, and uh, we are going to have to be transitioning away from that, uh, that um, gas uh, for heating uh, buildings and water in British Columbia. It's a lot easier to say than it is to do. But one of the things that um, uh, we've tried to develop, and I, I know I've talked to Tara about this before, is the uh, uh, proposal to take a lot of those people that are doing that work currently, that are planning um, new gas installations uh, in the Fortis area, is to take th those people and those skills that they have and turn them to building retrofits, which um, we are sort of agnostic whether it's uh, gas or electric, but the skills are completely transferable. They can just as easily do uh, electric retrofits as they can gas retrofits. And, and building uh, a case that British Columbia could be doing a lot more on retrofits, which will save tons of energy. It will save tons of, it will save lots of people, particularly elder, elderly people, lots of money if done properly. It will uh, make um, low-income housing a lot more efficient, saving people who are uh, experiencing low or um, uh, subsidized incomes uh, reduce their energy poverty. And self-interested for our union, it will keep those members at work using the skills that they've uh, gotten trained uh, and, and built, um, built up over their careers. So it's something that uh, Unions, I think, need to look at for those sorts of opportunities uh, to uh, be part of the solution uh, because those 500 members that we represent at, at Fortis, when someone says we've got to stop natural gas, they view that as a threat to their own livelihoods and their family's security. Uh, if they're my age, they don't necessarily think that they can get to another career uh, before uh, uh, they're doing that with um, with all the challenges going on in their life. So uh, it's important, I think, for unions to, to try and uh, find those places to be part of the climate solution uh, um, and uh, positive change rather than stuck in status quo systems. Thank you, Jen and David, especially for highlighting the point about building solidarity and power through being clear and also kind of showcasing those victories. Um, next question we have for you is to actually for all of our panelists, so maybe we can start with Tara. Um, how has your union or organization addressed climate change and the evolving needs of people in the climate crisis? Can you tell us some successes and challenges you have faced? Um, yeah, it's interesting. So we're in a kind of an interesting period where I think the labor movement has just kind of got to the stage where it's realizing that, well, a couple of things. One is having these conversations where a weather uh, event happens and it's become suddenly incredibly obvious to workers themselves that the climate crisis is actually gonna have a, a very real impact on their lives in the very short term, not uh, in the very long, uh, the very long term. Um, but I think we're also in a, period of time when unions themselves are changing and when the labor movement is changing quite a bit. And um, it's interesting, like I'm also a Gen Xer and uh, yeah, had the, the bad luck of having most of my adult life uh, during the neoliberal period. <laughs> um, which, you know, for- No one feels bad for <laughs> Tara. <laughs> no one feels bad for us. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, it was it was a bad time for unions, you know. I when I was uh, when I was a teenager, I guess uh, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan got into power. Um, this is 
probably history you might not be familiar with, but one of the things that Reagan did right away was uh, um, airport controllers uh, had a big strike and he decided to go after the unions by just firing them all. Uh, the PATCO strike, kind of an infamous event. And it was really devastating to what had been a real upturn in the labor movement. And so yeah, starting from the mid 80s, I guess, there was a real downturn in the labor movement. And so most of my career, um, you know, my, my own union, a little bit exceptional, I'd say, but not that much. Um, it's been holding on to what you have, not making gains uh, for something new. And that's really, really challenging because it impacts, uh, you know, how the union functions um, and the kind of ideas and um, robustness and creativity and all of that that you would see within the union itself. It really, um, people close ranks a little bit. Um, in a, in a protective, uh, and it, it also separates the union movement from the rest of uh, society, like pensions are a good example, right? The, the private sector kind of lost all their pensions and the only people left with it were public sector workers and then everyone hates us because we have these you know, gold-plated pensions. <laughs> and then you try and go on strike and people are kind of start with this negative attitude towards you. So that's kind of, like the last 30 years, it's been a really hard time for the union movement, but we're in a, we're in a time when things are really, really shifting and changing. And uh, you know, the stats are now that unions are more popular than they've been, I believe, since like the 50s. Um, and in certain places, like David talked about the US being different, and it, 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 you know, they're ahead of us on the good and the bad, typically. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, in this case, like the rates of organizing uh, are really increasing, which is incredibly exciting. But unions themselves are revitalizing as well. And I think that when a union revitalizes and becomes more democratic, uh, you know, it can shake away some of that conservatism and it can make things like organizing for climate so much easier and more effective. And so you see that in terms of what different unions are doing and how they're responding. Um, I really uh, am inspired by, um, in the last year, the uh, strike and, uh, you know, just what's the positions that have been taken and so on by the United Auto Workers, the UAW, um, who not only kind of did this historic strike making incredible gains, you know, and really audacious, like they went out saying, well, our wage demand is 40% because that's what the bosses got, so why wouldn't we get that too? <laughs> You know, which is absolutely the right position and was inspiring. Um, and of course, you know, you never get exactly what you ask for, but they did get 25 to 35 percent, depending on where you were. So they made incredible gains. But interestingly enough, too, they've kind of shifted on some social positions as well. So uh, they were one of the major unions to recently uh, support a ceasefire in the Middle East. And Interestingly enough, the UAW actually organizes some people who, are, uh, who work in the arms industry and they described what needs to happen there as a just transition, which I thought was kind of fascinating, um, kind of borrowing from the climate crisis in terms of what we have to do, the shift that we have to make, um, yeah, to be retooling workers to be doing different jobs. Um, so I would say <laughs> that my own union, um, you know, we're, we're teachers, so we're good at educating each other. Um, so I'd say one area of success that we've had has been uh, putting on uh, climate education and getting our members a lot more aware. Obviously we have like a particular um, uh, agency because we work in the K-12 uh, school system. So in terms of climate education, I'd say that's been an area um, where there's been some real success. Um, we are involved in curriculum change um, and I think we've done a lot um, to get climate curriculum uh, actually happening in a lot of schools and so I think that's been um, an area of success. I, I think during the climate strikes we were very good at um, building connections and solidarity with, uh, with students and that was like a really incredible moment. I know one school in Victoria where I'm from Actually, the entire school went to the climate strikes, including the kindergarten class. <laughs> <laughs> it was so adorable. Um, but that said, I think, uh, you know, we're behind in terms of 
you know, what's necessary, which is actually using our bargaining power uh, to make change. And I'd say that we're only at the early stages right now of thinking about, uh, you know, kind of what we all said on the last question, like how do we use our power to actually implement change? Um, we're, yeah, we're just at the beginning stages of thinking, like what do we want and how are we gonna actually use that power to get it? Um, so it, it's an exciting time because uh, it's starting, but uh, there's a lot of work to be done still. Thanks. Um, yeah, I agree with everything that you said. Um, just a couple stories from my organizing. Um, when I was with uh, Unite Here Local 40, our, our organizing was primarily focused on workplace issues um, and affordability. Pretty much nobody talked about climate or the way that we talked about climate was very different. And so um, at Local 40, we did fight against greenwashing. So the, the hotels would use climate as a way to try to cut housekeepers shifts um, or increase the workload for housekeepers. And so that was a way that it entered uh, or became a workplace issue and we, we organized around that to, to reduce or, or to um, fight and win against those cuts to, to housekeepers shifts um, and protect their, their job and their, their um, make sure that their work was happening at a safe pace. Um, and yeah, hotel work is, uh, is really physical. Like I've been on the floors with workers where they're sweating. It's really, really hard work and it gets harder when it's hot out um, or when it's really really cold out or when it's smoky out. Um, and so having a unionized workplace makes it more likely that workers can take their breaks, um, which is even more important in extreme heat. Um, and at Local 40, we also won transit passes for workers, um, which for us was more about affordability than for climate, but I guess it is a climate issue. Um, and then just really quickly, um, right now I'm working at the SRO Collaborative, which is uh, doing tenant organizing in the downtown east side, and their emergency preparedness makes its way into our organizing, and so um, we prepare tenants for heat waves, uh, make sure that they're safe, um, because the, the buildings that they live in often get way, way, way too hot, um, and it's not safe for them, and so we um, recruit tenant leaders um, to hand out water and cooling kits and, and check in on their neighbors. Um, and yeah, just in general, what I think it should look like for, um, for labor to take cl climate issues more seriously, um, generally is I think like to win on climate, we need to radically expand the circle of people who see climate as an issue in their lives, um, and as relevant to their, to their lives and to their fights, um, because if, if we don't do that, we won't build power and we won't win. Um, and I think part of what that looks like is trying to merge workplace and non-workplace issues and not kind of keep it, keep them as completely separate. Um, so workers are also tenants. They're also people impacted by climate change. They're impacted by white supremacy, cis heteropatriarchy, education, all of these things. And so if we keep the labor movement isolated to the workplace, we're missing out on so many things that impact workers' lives. Um, and so we need to engage with workers' communities to be able to win bigger and not just stay with an insular focus on the workplace and on what's happening in the workplace. Yeah, so um, WSN is not a uh, union, but we are a nonprofit that supports workers with grievances um, like wage theft or discrimination or harassment. Um, and during the 2021 heat dome, we were receiving an increase in worker complaints. And um, this was also including, you know, workers who were in indoor spaces, which is not often where our mind might go when we think about extreme weather. Uh, we might be looking more so at construction and, and agriculture. And so that was, that was um, you know, a sort of pivotal point in our campaign work um, and sort of kick-started that as well. And during that 2021 heat dome, WorkSafe BC received um, a 180% increase in worker complaints that came through. And over a third of those were related to indoor workers. Um, so for us, we started a community engaged research project that focused specifically on indoor workers. And we chose uh, the food service sector. 
Um, and uh, we looked at you know how these workers are um, coping and and you know what strategies are they taking um, again these sort of normalized components of just standing in a walk-in freezer to cool down or putting you know a damp rag on your shoulders to cope um, yeah very ad hoc um, strategies and so one of our biggest successes was was um, connecting with these workers um, through outreach and having conversations with them and sharing circles um, and and sort of identifying and pinpointing what it is that we need to be demanding in these spaces and so it was actually a, a group of over 30 workers who came together um, to help us build the campaign that we're, we're working on now and um, you know we have we have demands everywhere from you know status for for all um, to free and clean transit. Um, and so that's that sort of built and, and shaped our, our campaign work at WSN. And one of the challenges that came from that as well was of course that food service work and other low wage sectors, it's, it's often precarious retail and, and hospitality. And so upholding those voices can be a challenge, even you know, connecting and, and building trust and camaraderie with those folks as well. Um, there's a lot of fear of retaliation from employers and that's very real. Um, and so, um, yeah, and, and something I, I wanna highlight as well is that we know that workers have voices. It's not that they don't, it's that the people in power aren't listening. Um, and so that's where I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Jen. Just really quickly, I think that um, unions have to walk the talk. And so uh, my union committed to becoming uh, um, net zero uh, back about 15 years ago. and. Um, uh, it has purchased offsets to uh, offset what couldn't be reduced or eliminated. So there's a financial incentive but, but through that policy to keep trying to work at that. Uh, one of the major things we did is in 2015, uh, we moved out of leased space and purchased our own building. And um, partially because of that policy that we had adopted, we made sure that that building was built to uh, lead gold standards. So we are redu our union was reducing our own uh, climate impact as well. Um, we also uh, did manage to bargain in uh, before the period of time that Tara was talking about into some of our collective agreements and uh, an addition to the occupational health and safety requirements in some of our collective agreements, we included environmental in that uh, so that things like some of these bigger working conditions that don't necessarily uh, get thought of as a day-to-day -day, uh, occupation, health, and safety, which actually comes with a lot of, uh, there's a lot of statutory support for those things, brought that to the environmental side as well. It sort of got stopped, but um, it's, it's still there. And the other thing is uh, people who work in, uh, for NGOs, ENGOs, uh, Greenpeace and Ecojustice, we've organized the workers there, uh, and that helps us um, keep in contact with those organizations because those people participate in our union uh, as members of our union and when we're talking about these policies we have our own in-house experts now who help inform that debate makes for some very interesting debates when you get the gas people and the Greenpeace people uh, talking on, on issues but you know the debate is healthy right and if you can get to uh, if you can get to a physician then it makes it all all the more powerful awesome thank you so much for all those incredible answers um, so now we're going to transition into our Q&A portion. Um, so I'll invite Joaquin back up to help us um, I don't know, identify some questions. Is there any? Yeah. Here. Oh, yeah. Is there? Yeah, yeah, there is a couple. Um, I encourage you to scan the QR code and submit any questions you may have. Um, so yeah, why don't we get started with the first ones. Lots of ones that have been liked. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So our first question: um, What are what were the best strategies to convince people to fight for causes that they did not originally resonate with, um, within a peaceful and efficient manner? Yeah. I'll repeat the question again. Um, what were the best strategies to convince people to fight for causes that they did not originally resonate with in a peaceful and efficient manner? Anyone that uh, feels they have a response is allowed to answer the question. 
I'll, I'll jump in to fill the space, so I'm hoping that my <laughs> colleagues will come up with smarter stuff after. Um, <laughs> but we, we, uh, there was something that uh, I used to say in my union a lot, that um, when you need a friend, it's too late to make a friend. And uh, labor unions are about disrupting the status quo and are about systemic change. And they're not going to do it by themselves. And so uh, I, I, uh, I, I, when discussing this issue that Jen was talking about, about, um, about getting people um, motivated and uh, interested beyond their workplaces, um, it's like if, if someone comes after us, we're not going to be able to stop them by ourselves. Uh, like if someone's coming after BC Hydro, if someone's coming after ICBC, if somebody's coming after the bus company, if somebody's coming after any of us, we are not strong enough to stand up to that ourselves. But if we work in, in um, solidarity with other unions and other groups, then we are more likely to be able to resist that or to make positive change, more importantly. And, and, and so in order to count on those friends, you first have to be a friend to those organizations. So. I was very, um, uh, my secretary treasurer used to get angry at me all the time because I always wanted to assist other folks with financial donations when they help. Like if, if someone's trying to, um, uh, you know, if there was a community that had a partic particular environmental challenge, I always wanted to support that because we had gotten a lot of support from those communities and communities like that when our fight against the run of the rivers things was happening. So it's about building those solidarities. You've got to be there for other people so that they're f there for you. Uh, and those relationships, um, because the inherently there's conflict within them, they, it takes a lot of energy and intentionality to nurture those. And I think that that's, that's something that, um, uh, uh, to get back to the question, that's something that unions need to do with their members. They need to continue that education that we're not just workers, we're members of a community, we're, we're members of uh, um, uh, different uh, ethnic groups. We're, we're, we're members of the broader communities and our struggles, the, com the struggles of the communities are our struggles as well. And uh, our struggles are also the community struggles. And if there's a misalignment there, you probably need want to have a real close look at that because it's probably uh, some sort of a false consciousness or uh, a misplaced priority then if you're that far unaligned. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, you know what else to add beyond <laughs> that building that solidarity, but um, I think challenging norms as well and, and giving folks space to identify um, what they believe you know themselves um, to be an issue. And um, I think you know food is another excellent way to bring folks together. We do this through outreach, um, you know, bringing people to poster. Um, we physically went into a lot of food service establishments when we were trying to recruit uh, workers for our project and and you know learn about their experiences and what their demands might be. And this proved to be very challenging, um, especially when we found our you know, ourselves in spaces like Starbucks, which is also notoriously difficult to unionize. Um, you know, employers might give those workers a, a bit of grief if they see someone talking to, you know, a labor organizer or a union member. Um, so we had to be very strategic in how we accessed these workers. Um, it, it at first looked like handing physical flyers, um, and then it went down to just ordering a coffee and giving a sticker, and that sticker was a QR code, and it would lead them to our website, um, and they could, you know, sign up to to be part of a sharing circle. And so um, we, we had to, it was a lot of trial and error and we had to be very strategic in how we accessed the voices that we knew we needed to be upholding. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Um, yeah, just a couple of things to add. Um, I think um, there's a, a whole bunch of strategies for how to convince people. Um, and I had to do this a lot when I was organizing for a strike. Um, and for contract fights in general. Um, I think just a few things that come immediately to mind. The first thing is to be curious and just ask a lot of questions. Um, because often, in, in my experience, I, as the organizer, need to understand how something is impacting somebody first in order to be able to move them. Um, and so it's not, the, the person that I'm talking to, if they don't already agree with me, they're not going to be convinced by me ranting at them. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. So I need to ask questions and try to really understand what's going on in their life and also why I think they should care about it, um, putting myself in their shoes. I think that's probably the biggest thing. 
Um, the other thing that I really learned in labor organizing is um, we need to not be afraid of having discipline and principles struggle with people and disagree with them and not let them you know, get away with saying ridiculous things or um, saying that things aren't impacting them when we know that they are. Um, and something that helps with that often is relationships. Um, as a young woman in, um, in labor, I can't tell you the number of times when an older man would brush me off because I didn't, I didn't know anything about you know, how to be a cook. I'm not a cook, I don't know. Um, I don't know what it's like to be a cook, but I had to build that relationship with, with the cook or with the server or with the housekeeper, or whoever it was, so that they would know that I was on their side um, and be able to trust me and then open up um, with how issues that we were, how workplace issues were actually impacting them. Because um, sometimes it can be really hard to, to say that you're struggling with, with something like affordability, um, especially in like neoliberalism that, that um, teaches us that it's every person's individual responsibility not to struggle. Um, the other thing that I'll just say about this is that I think sometimes when people say they disagree with us, it's actually a sign of alienation and disempowerment because, and, and it's can not really, sometimes it's not necessarily that they don't care about the issue, it's that they don't think that we can win yeah. and that they're afraid to try to win. Mm -hmm. And so it's our job as organizers or as people who are trying to move, um, move our coworkers, move our, our members or whoever, um, to empower people um, and to see, t and to get them to see that we can win and that there is a pathway to win. We just have to work together on it. Yeah, I think the relationship thing is really important and just, um, you know, I think David brought it up that uh, the way NGOs are structured is people come by choice, right? They volunteer. So you end up with a group of people who already have the same ideas, basically. Um, and unions are really interesting organizing spaces because uh, you have, like, twin things happening at the same time. Uh, on the one hand, you all ended up in this workplace, you know, you didn't choose each other, right? You chose the job. Um, and at the same time, you have relationships by virtue of you know, the conditions in your workplace. And so um, I'll just <laughs> so what that means, and um, actually one of my heroes, organizing heroes, I'm, I'm sure the panel is all familiar, uh, Jane McAlevey. Um, she loves to categorize things. Anyway, so, so she talks about uh, workplaces as a structure, and so you're organizing within a structure. Um, and so one of the great features of the structure is that you build a relationship based on your, your work and doing your work together, but then you're in this other relationship in a union together, and so you already have a connection and you have a space to get into dialogue about things that maybe you don't agree on. So super different, right, than when you come to a Greenpeace meeting or something. Um, and just like, what does that actually look like on the ground? I'll just tell a little personal story. So, um, so I taught uh, information technology in a computer lab and I had to share the lab with a teacher who taught entrepreneurship. <laughs> and, uh, when, <laughs> when Trump won the election, he thought it was a really good idea to put a big poster of Trump up in the classroom. <laughs> so <laughs> this required a conversation. Um, but fortunately, we, we had a principle that we both really didn't like. And so we had actually, <laughs> we had already bonded over our mutual dislike of the principle. <laughs> and so when I said, you know, you have to take that down, like, you know, the guy's a sexist jerk, and how do you think your female students are gonna feel? Um, like, he was just willing to listen to me because we both hated the boss, right? <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of what it looks like in practice, but it just demonstrates, you know, you build that connection based on your workplace, but then you have a space to talk about social issues, and you have, you listen to each other in a way that maybe you wouldn't in another environment. Thank you for all those amazing responses. Uh, now I'll open the floor also to questions here. We have a mic runner here, Daphne. Um, so whoever wants to ask uh, in person, that's also totally okay. Uh, I'll also like to remind the panelists, not everyone has to answer, so. <laughs> <laughs> in order to get to as many uh, questions as we can, um, we can also just try to limit like one or two panelists per question. Um, so is there any question that we have here? There's one over there. 
Thanks. Hi, I'm Sam. Um, I'm actually the president of CUPE Local 2278, so representing the academic workers here at UBC. Uh, I do have a real question, but I am also going to do a tiny bit of self-promotion um, <laughs> to all of the folks who are members and are interested in this kind of stuff. Come talk to me about how you can get involved. We also have an ongoing organizing campaign happening at UBC right now for the work learn. So if you are a work learn, please come talk to me and our organizer here. That would be great. But one of the things that you mentioned was kind of about organizing and you know, unions as this sort of existing structure. So at UBC, we've actually had huge success with organizing, um, particularly graduate students. Uh, we filed to unionize over 3,000 people to additional to join our, um, our local. And so there is actually big uh, sort of hunger and excitement, um, particularly around wages and working conditions. One of the things that we have seen um, that hasn't been con as consistent um, is dealing with kind of these other broader, broader social questions um, in our union. And I think that's really interesting because we are a union of students and there are people who are interested, who are doing work, who are, you know, here in these rooms and they're not making those connections uh, with their work, with their union local. And so I wonder if like with specifically within the UBC context, um, if you have any sort of recommendations for how we get people who are already in these activist circles within UBC to get more involved in their union, you know, from a climate perspective. Anyone? Ms. Baker? Gabby? <laughs> pressure <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I don't know that I have an answer for you um, besides I guess like hmm, how I would approach it as an organizer would be to set a goal and then to figure out if I can meet the goal and why I wasn't meeting the goal um, for instance in like in terms of number of people to get involved um, and my general approach also to organizing is usually like if I'm not meeting the goal that means that I'm not talking to the leaders. Uh, so I'm not talking to the right people, essentially. Uh, and often, in, in my union organizing days, um, something would just kind of unlock when I talk to somebody that moved their coworkers or that moved their friends or whoever it is um, to, to be involved. Um, so that's, I don't know, that's maybe something. Um, the other thing is, Hmm. Sometimes, sometimes labor is not as like sexy as other kinds of organizing, and so finding ways to to like build relationships and do that like deeper and slower work, um, I think it creates more lasting opportunities for folks to get involved rather than like flashpoint actions. I don't know if that's if that's helpful. That's what I got. I can add one small idea. Um, just from uh, the campaign perspective that we're working on right now is, um, you know, shifting language in our messaging as well. Um, so, you know, connecting with fast food workers, for example, if we're trying to talk to them about something like a maximum temperature policy, that's not really sexy. Um, so pivoting to something like too hot to work might resonate with someone. So it might also be a question of changing the messaging and, and maybe making it a bit more accessible um, as well. Yeah. Any thoughts? Thank you, Gabby and Jen. Um, now let's take one from um, Slido. From a labor perspective, what does the climate movement get wrong get wrong about the just transition? Uh, any taker here? Tara, and then maybe David. Um, yeah, and this isn't my original thought or anything, but. Um, when you're a worker facing a layoff or uh, a 
plant closure. Um, it's, it's very immediate. And I think uh, the climate movement talks, often talks about the just transition in really sort of broad and general terms, but doesn't put um, the actual livelihood of workers first. Um, and that just rings hollow for people for whom, uh, you know, they're just facing job loss, moving out of their community, um, what have you. And so I think there's a real disconnect there. And you see it really often, you know, you'll see a set of demands and they'll be um, super concrete. Like I was just looking at one around LNG a year or so ago. Um, super concrete and then they'll get to, you know, they know they have to have the just transition in there, <laughs> but they don't get further than saying, and a just transition. You know, they don't, they don't say, um, you know, uh, two years wages and relocation allowance <laughs> and, you know, the actual concrete things that would, um, that would make it feasible for people to be a part of that just transition. Um, yeah, so in my mind, that's kind of the biggest, the biggest error. Yeah, I, I think that Tara's hit it on the head. Um, very specifically um, on that, uh, in the work that I've done with the Climate Solutions Council, and I should say that that ended this week. Uh, they've replaced me on the Climate Solutions Council, so I'm not there anymore. But um, in talking about training for the new jobs of the future, there's a lot of talk about micro-skilling and getting people into jobs really quickly. And that's really uh, a very negative thing from the labor movement's point of view, uh, particularly from folks that are in the building trades, because of what, what, what you're doing is you're institutionalizing contingent labor. Because someone might, you might train someone to uh, have the skills to work on a certain model of a heat pump, but if there's a new innovation in heat pumps and there's a new model that's got substantial uh, technological improvements, those people aren't qualified anymore. And so the job that they had is by definition, only going to be a for a few years, and they're not going to be qualified for the next jobs that come afterwards. And we know that the economy is changing faster and faster and faster all the time. So, uh, when it comes to things like that, we really need to go back. It, it sounds like a conservative position, but the things like Red Seal uh, jobs for tradespeople, where someone is a heating and refrigeration technician, and they have the skills to do all of the work for that. And they also have the built-in system to continually upgrading their skills as the technology and the systems changes because then they have some security in their jobs and they're able to plan, you know, having a mortgage, hopefully one day, uh, having families and so on. But if you're going from jobs that last two or three years, two or three years, two or three years, and you don't know where the next one's going to be, I recognize that that's a re big reality these days, but uh, we should resist that as much as possible because it, it, is, uh, it is a problem. And too often I see people from the ENGOs think that micro-skilling is a, a panacea. It's a way to get people to work quickly, uh, but it, it's not lasting and it doesn't provide that job security. I'm gonna flip that on its head as well because I think just transition isn't and shouldn't just be about people with existing jobs. There's lots of people, there's lots of communities in our economy that are underemployed or not employed. And just transition needs to take those people into account as well. Everyone's talking about skills, skills shortages. We have skills shortages. We don't have worker shortages. We just have a shortage of getting those people the skills to do the work that needs to be done. And so it's about having a holistic uh, look at the economy and the transitions that we uh, need to go through. And, uh, and I think that um, uh, the climate movement needs to have, take a broader view of that rather than just, we are in a climate crisis. I don't want to say we're not in a climate crisis. It requires urgent action, but you can't throw these other things out because you're going to leave people even further behind, particularly people who are already left behind. Amazing. Thank you, Tara and David. Now, uh, we have time for about like one, max two questions. So there was one over here. Uh, it's been a while since I held a mic and my voice shakes. Uh, my name is Roger Newell. Uh, I work here. I'm a building service worker. You can thank me for clean toilets, clean waste sorting rooms, all that. Uh, I, I was kidding, don't clap for me, Christ. Jesus, oh my God, I'm now I'm embarrassed. Uh, I actually wanted to bring it back to UBC, but 
to draw kind of a broader question. Climate change here on campus seems to be um, owned by management in a sense, and I think this is probably pretty common. And uh, we recently have had a couple of little, little initiatives and it's received as more work by, by us, because it is, because uh, they don't think things through and we have more work uh, because they get tax dollars for their initiatives. <laughs> My question is, um, if management and people agreed, uh, the university owns climate change, if that's broad, how do we take it into our hands? Because listening to the panel, there's fantastic things happening. Like you could have gone on, you could you could have gone uh, about uh, uh, Jen, especially Gabby, lots and lots of conversations. But how do we make it so when people think climate change, they're thinking of our class because we're all workers, and we're going to be workers. So how how and. I don't think you're going to answer this in five minutes. I think all of us should ask ourselves this question of, of how we take control of this. The same way that, in, in not perfectly, but the same way labor took um, ownership of uh, equality for women. And it, and it wouldn't have happened without labor. So how do we own climate change? Or, you know what I mean. <laughs> Thank you for that amazing question. Anyone here interested? Tara? Thank you. Yeah, I think you're 100% correct, right? If we don't do it, they're going to do it, and they're not going to, it's not going to be a just transition. It'll be a transition, but it'll be an unjust transition. Um, that said, um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I guess frustration at how that's coming across can be an entry point. In my experience, the biggest entry point for workers into con who aren't otherwise interested for conversations about climate change is actually a severe weather event that impacts them directly. Um, but once that happens, then you have an opening to, to start making those conversations. Um, but you're absolutely right. Like, you know, the, the response, and I mean this is true like in a worker environment, but on a kind of global political environment too, right? There's there's a just transition and there's eco-fascism. Like <laughs> and you know, that's why it's so critical that workers are the drive to, to what we do. Um, and you can't create all these uh, false dichotomies, right? Where it's like we pay for the cost of fixing things. And so often any environmental uh, kind of initiative is framed that way and you create a huge backlash. Um, you know, you can look at like changes in agriculture, for example, that are being mandated in Europe right now. And there's a huge backlash because was that worker initiated? No, it was imposed. And so, uh, I mean, of course, this is the neoliberal response, right? Make workers pay for the change. So we absolutely have to be there. So yeah, as soon as those conversations start happening, and maybe it is through frustration of management uh, imposition, then that's the time to talk about why we have to be, uh, you know, center and take charge. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And in, in having those discussions internally in the union, on the micro scale, like the stupid, th the stupid thing they've got us doing isn't actually contributing to uh, reducing emissions, because we're on the job, we're on the tools, we know, and then building from that. Um, but I'm just going to correct one thing you said at the outset. The, the, the labor movement didn't own women's issues. Women owned the labor movement. That was a, I'm old enough to remember that struggle. And you know the labor movement didn't say, come on in women, we've got a place for you. They had to fight for that every single step of the way. And those struggles are still ongoing within the labor movement. So uh, you know we have not had a, uh, a non-white person who's been the president of the BC Federation of Labor or anything like that. There's still lots of struggles that, that are happening within the labor movement and we need to encourage those discussions and those diverse voices to do that, and they will help contribute to the problem that you've just, you've raised. Thank you, David. Now, um, Jen, Gabby, uh, or again, David, Tara, any closing thoughts or answer to this question? Very well, then. <laughs> I'll pass it on to Jess for some closing words. Thank you. 
All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. Just MC Geography and also a part of the Climate Certificate and this amazing class that I'm teaching with Sarah Harris over there. So I just want to, I'm just here to give thanks to everyone for attending and to some of our partners, the Center for Climate Justice uh, helped put this all together. Porter from Geography, who's, who's videoing, yay, <laughs> Porter. Um, thank you, Tim from the Sustainability Hub, also big uh, help for putting this all on. And I think that's everything. Joaquin, Carly, Curie, thank you for um, moderating. Juliet and Rachel for getting us going and everyone else in the class for all the background work too. It's a lot of work to put one of these on. And I guess just finally thanking the panelists so much for your really wise words. Um, so much to take from this. Sorry for putting you on the spot, Gabby, <laughs> but you had a lot to say, I knew. Um, yeah, so just really grateful for starting this conversation and I hope more of it happens, especially with these local UBC unions that are all present here uh, as well. So I think we'll wrap there and please take any final cookies or oranges and feel free to mill around and say hi to one another. So yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks.